but welcome to tonight's event. My name is Nick. I'm a bookseller here at Powell's Books in Portland, uh, Powell's City of Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to remind you, you can keep up to date with all our events by visiting powells.com slash events. You can also follow us on all major social media platforms, including Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Tom Hartman back to Pals. He is a four-time winner of the Project Censored Award, a New York Times bestselling author of over 30 books that have been translated into multiple languages, and Talkers Magazine named him America's number one most important progressive host, and he's been the host of one of the top 10 radio shows in the country for every year for more than a decade. He is here to discuss his newest book, The Hidden History of Neoliberalism how Reaganism gutted America, and how to restore it to greatness. Within its pages, Hartman reveals how and why neoliberalism became so prevalent in the United States and why it's time for us to turn our backs to it. While America is at a crossroads regarding its economic future, many of us don't fully understand how we got here. In this, in this powerful and accessible new book, Hartman demystifies neoliberalism and explains how we can use this pivotal point in time to create a more positive future. Uh, tonight's event will include an, a, a Q&A portion. We'll all, we'll all have the honor of relaying the questions to Tom. So please ask any questions down in the Q&A box instead of in the chat. If you see any questions you'd also like to know the answer to, please click the like button so that, um, or that's really the thumbs up button. So I'll know that that is a question that isn't to be missed. Uh, I'll be dropping the links to, to Tom's books in the chat during the events tonight. So be sure to click on those links to support him and Powell's books. And now, please give a warm welcome to Tom Hartman. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Adam. And thank you, Powell's Books, uh, the world's best bookstore and one of my favorite destinations for decades. So uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be back here at Powell's. And thank you so much. I wanted to talk about uh, the hidden history of neoliberalism, uh, how Reaganism gutted, gutted America, the, the, this new book. And I, I, I think a, a good place to start is why neoliberalism. Uh, I'll get to exactly what neoliberalism is in just a moment. But the why, uh, th this came out of a, an initial meeting in 1936 in Paris, and then a later meeting in 1947 in, in uh, or 1945 in uh, Switzerland. Um, and uh, it was a group of economists, by and large. There were a few people who weren't economists, but but mostly this was driven by a group of economists. And the most prominent among them uh, were uh, Hayek, Mises, and Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman was the American. Uh, pretty much everybody else was a European. And uh, they were they were trying to figure out, and this is a, a classic example of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. They were trying to figure out a way to harden democracies, essentially, um, you know, Western nations, uh, particularly Europe, uh, which had just, you know, was in the middle of or was just wrapping up the second, you know, world war in, in two generations, um, to, to harden them against either becoming communist, as Russia had done, or becoming fascist, as had happened to Spain, Italy, and Germany. And being economists, uh, they thought economics would be the solution. I mean, this is a classic example of, you know, psychologist Abraham Maslow's famous saying that when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem in the world looks like a nail. Um, but they, they thought they had figured it out, that they had come up with a solution, um, an economic, largely economic solution, which required political action to put it into place. So you could argue that it was a political solution as well as an economic one. Um, and 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 they wanted to uh, extend, you know, the idea of uh, liberal economics. Now they were Europeans, with the exception of Friedman. And on continental Europe, the word liberal means the exact opposite of what it means here. And there, it would mean conservative or even libertarian, laissez-faire, hands-off. Uh, government doesn't meddle in the in the economy. That's liberal economics in Europe. And they wanted to even go beyond that. And so this was the new liberalism or the neoliberalism, and thus the source of the word. Here in the United States, we typically refer to it as Reaganomics, trickle-down economics, supply-side economics, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, these three guys got together and they and they put this thing together. And, and the, uh, the essential outline of uh, neoliberalism uh, is comprised of, uh, you know, basically six or seven major points. Uh, the first is the idea that the marketplace is inherently more brilliant, competent, 
and uh, well informed than any bureaucrat or politician ever could be. There are literally millions of decisions being made in the marketplace every minute. Uh, as we speak, there's probably a thousand people trying to decide which brand of orange juice to buy. You know, uh, just literally millions or billions of, of, of decisions in the marketplace. And, and they viewed this as, as a source of intelligence, as, as data, as, as, um, as an information resource that should drive economies. Now, in pushing back against that right now, uh, before I continue with the with the list of things that make up neoliberalism, let me just say that in and of itself was a, basically an insane idea. Um, economics or economies rather are just games that we play. We we play them for money, unlike football that we play for you know with a with a ball made out of I guess it's plastic these days. It used to be pigskin, um, but it's just a game. And games have to have rules, and the rules have to be consistent, and they have to be predictable, and they have to work to the benefit of the game itself. They have to perpetuate the game, and they also have to work to the benefit of the people who are essentially the consumers of the game. You know, um, if you were to apply their logic that because the market has the greatest wisdom, therefore the market should be making all the decisions, and that very much was their idea. That's the core idea of neoliberalism. The governments can't make good decisions. Only markets can make good decisions. But you know, within the game of, of capitalism, in, in the market, um, you've got all kinds of different players. And their theory was that the players who have risen to the top, the very, very wealthy, the billionaires, the large corporations, they have the largest access to information, to all that, that, that zillions of, of decisions. And they've also survived a Darwinian process of evolution and demonstrated their competence so they should be making the rules for the marketplace. And like I said, I think this is nuts. It's like saying whichever team in the NFL has the, the most money or wins the most games should be able to decide how many players are on the field at any given time and can decide to give themselves three more players than the other team because, hey, we won the last four games. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to have the winners in a game decide the rules of the game. The rules of the game should be neutral. But you know, nonetheless, that was the first tenet of neoliberalism. Secondly, they, they believed that any kind of interference in the marketplace distorted the marketplace and thus prevented the market from working its magic. And uh, so deregulation was at the top of their list. All government regulation should basically be disposed of. And when I say all, I literally mean all. Um, you know, they haven't done that here, but th th that was the goal, and they're still working in that direction. Um, Milton Friedman, in one of his books, uh, has an entire chapter about how, you know, all forms of regulation are bad, including licensure, and he has an entire chapter arguing that doctors shouldn't be licensed. Why? Because the marketplace will solve that problem. If you've got some guy who's pretending to be a doctor and he's doing surgery on people and they're dying, dropping like flies, word will spread. And people will stop going to him and the market will correct itself. Um, you know, there's no need for the marketplace or for government to make sure that drugs are actually safe and pure and are what they say they are. Because, you know, if a drug manufacturer is selling, you know, contaminated drugs or drugs that are not as effective, the word will get around, people will figure it out, and that'll be the end of that. So deregulation was number two. Number three is that another major distortion or uh, variable that distorts marketplaces is uh, labor unions, is the interference in the normal functioning of and, and decision making of a business by people who work for that business, who should be basically subordinate to the business. And so another premise of neoliberalism is that labor unions, you know, they, they can be social clubs, but they can't have power. And you know we've certainly seen America move in that direction over the last 40 years since uh, Ronald Reagan imp imposed neoliberalism on the United States in 1981. Another uh, aspect of the labor consideration of theirs was that corporations should be able to seek the cheapest labor they, they can find anywhere they can find it. The national borders should not matter, that all corporations should have the ability to be transnational. And you know, if you want to manufacture your widgets in China because you can get cheap labor or even slave labor there, um, no problem, do it. 
And thus, we have seen since the Reagan revolution, we've seen over 60,000 American factories close or, or move out of the country. And uh, between 10 and 15 million people, according to government statistics, uh, some economists argue as many as 25 million Americans have lost good paying jobs that were associated with those 60,000 factories. And, and you know, even the 60,000 factories is probably a low number. Like I said, that's the federal government number. Uh, for purposes of uh, Bill Clinton passed a law that um, the government would provide uh, payments or you know support education for people to retrain themselves. So that's where those numbers came from. And a lot of people didn't knock on the federal government's door and say, hey, I need that retraining money. So free trade is the uh, fourth aspect of neoliberalism. Um, the idea that um, a social safety net uh, should exist was in their minds another distortion of the marketplace. Uh, they believed that people wouldn't work if they weren't frightened. Uh, if poverty, you know, the poverty is the great motivator, you know, the old Republicans saying, what do you do when somebody's down? You kick them, otherwise they won't get up. And uh, so their idea was that uh, social security should be gone or, you know, it should be turned into a private insurance program that, you know, New York banks can run, uh, which of course is something Republicans have been trying to do since the 1930s. Uh, Medicare, same deal. And George Bush actually did this. In 2003, his Medicare reforms, he rolled out this brand new product called Medicare Advantage, which isn't actually Medicare. It's, it's private for-profit insurance, not always for-profit. There are some nonprofit players like Kaiser in that market, but it's basically private insurance, um, you know, with all the same problems of normal pri private insurance and, you know, people get screwed, et cetera. Um, and now about 50% of Medicare has been privatized through that program. Um, you know, which is just a disaster. One of the arguments against the social safety net, in fact, was made by, by, uh, by Hayek, who in a chapter in his book, in one of his books, I believe it was The Road to Serfdom, talks about how uh, Germany was the first country to have a national health care system, a single payer national health care system it was put into place in 1888 by Kaiser Wilhelm. And uh, as I lay out in my previous book, The Hidden History of Healthcare. And uh, Hayek argued that uh, Germans got comfortable, fat and lazy, basically, um, by having free health care and having free education as well. You could go to college for basically free in Germany, which is still the case today, by the way. And uh, in fact, there's tens of thousands of Americans going to college in Germany right now and for free tuition. But Hayek made the case that that was what caused the rise of Nazism. And therefore, we have to do away with these uh, social welfare programs. The whole social safety net is a bad idea. It should be uh, destroyed. And which is why Bill Clinton said, you know, the end of uh, the era of uh, big government is, is here and, and we have ended welfare as we know it. Another provision was the belief that people who had risen to the top and corporations that had risen to the top of the economy were, as I said earlier, the Darwinian uh, you know, they had survived the Darwinian evolutionary process. They were the clear winners. Uh, they also had the most information. Um, and so they should be the least inhibited in what they do. And one of the great inhibitors of economic activity is taxes. So, uh, you know, neoliberalism has created a situation now where the, uh, you know, the, the, the average income tax paid by America's 700 billionaires is around 300, is around 3%, whereas the rest of us pay, you know, 20, 30% in income taxes. And uh, more than half of the Fortune 500 companies pay no taxes at all, no income taxes at all, even as they are claiming multi billion dollar profits. So uh, cutting taxes on the rich, raising taxes on the poor, that's all right. You know, Reagan doubled the uh, social security tax, for example. In fact, Reagan increased taxes on working people 18 times, uh, you know, in addition to what turned out to be about a $6 trillion tax cut for the rich, um, you know, over the next couple of decades. Cutting tax is a big piece of it. Privatizing public functions. Uh, neoliberals believe that uh, it's appropriate for government to run the army and the police, but that's it. Fire departments should be privatized. Roads should be privatized. If uh, you know companies want to come in and buy up public roads and turn them into toll roads, great. They'll they'll run those roads better than the government ever would. Um, that uh, you know anything that the government does should be handed off to somebody who can make a buck off it, so that it, it inserts itself into the so-called free market. We shouldn't have uh, government, for example, running electric companies. About half of the electricity in the United States is is generated and sold by private for-profit corporations now and half by municipalities. 
dozens of studies have proven over the years that those uh, cities and counties and states that generate their own electricity at the at, by government do so at a lower cost with better efficiency and greater reliability. But you know their theory was that if you put all this in the hands of for-profit corporations, they'd do it more efficiently and cheaper, and therefore everything would be wonderful. In fact, those corporations have to pay their CEOs multi-million-dollar salaries. They got to show a profit. They've got to distribute that profit to their shareholders as dividends, et cetera. But anyhow, privatize everything. And, uh, and finally, they believed that the existence of great inequalities of wealth, uh, for example, right now, there are two uh, American men who control more wealth than the bottom half of the entire American population. Uh, and, and monopolies in, in business were actually signs of a properly functioning economy. And I think you could argue that if you're talking pure, raw, unregulated capitalism, that's exactly how it works. Charles, Charles uh, Dickens wrote uh, about unregulated capitalism in virtually all of his books. Most people are familiar with The Christmas Carol. Um, in unregulated capitalism, you have that kind of a situation that, that Dickens described. You have the, the top 1%, which in, in Christmas Carol, they don't even appear in that book. That would be the royal family and the big landowners and factory owners. Then you've got a very small middle class, typically 3 to 5%, which is what Scrooge was. Scrooge and Marley was a little tiny company with two employees, Scrooge and, and Bob Cratchit. And uh, just a small business. He was a, a middle class small businessman, and the middle class is made up of doctors and lawyers and and uh, merchants and things like that. And then you've got the ninety five percent who are the working poor who live their entire lives in debt. That's the resting state of capitalism. That's the norm of capitalism. It was that way here in the United States too, and most people are not aware of this. It's been one hundred and twenty years since the, the census of nineteen hundred, but uh, it was revisited in two thousand. Um, by the Bush administration, and they went back and they compiled some statistics, and they found that in the census of 1900, um, the uh, first of all, the average lifespan of American men was 47 years, and uh, excuse me, 45 years, no, 47 years, and the average family income in $2,000 in the dollars of the year 2000 was $4,500, and. Uh, so basically, the vast majority of Americans were the working poor. We had a relatively small middle class in the United States. It was less, well, well under 10%. Nobody is really sure exactly. So, I mean, that's the neoliberal world. That's, that's unregulated capitalism. So that was their idea. So how did this become a thing? Right? These guys came up with this idea in, in the 1940s, um, and they started trying to sell it. And Milton Friedman was its main salesperson here in the United States to the Chicago School of Economics, where he taught. And uh, throughout the 40s and the 50s and even the early 60s, um, well, throughout the 60s, actually, uh, Friedman and Hayek and Mises, you know, while their books were doing well and they were, you know, doing their little sales pitch, their little circle of true believers, most people considered them crackpots. And then came the Arab oil embargo, the, the Israeli Arab War of 1973. And the Arabs cut off oil to the United States for about four months. And the price of oil tripled uh, within a week. And, uh, and this was on top of, in 1971 and in 72, Nixon having devalued the dollar by 10% twice. So we had a 20% devaluation of the dollar. He'd taken us off the gold standard, which was part of that. But these were two intentional devaluations after he took us off the gold standard. That causes inflation, although it takes typically about a decade for a devaluation to really work its way through the economy. So Nixon figured that the Fed could deal with that. It would just you know, show up slowly over time. But uh, we had these two devaluations of our currency. And then on top of that, in 73, we got hit with this huge in increase in the price of oil, and that produced wild inflation. And uh, so Milton Friedman, at that time, he was writing a column for, for uh, one of the big syndicators. So he was in every newspaper in America every week. Uh, he, was, he was writing magazine articles constantly. He was on TV all over the place. If you remember that era, you, you remember Milton Friedman um, showing up in Parade Magazine and being in Newsweek and Time Magazine. And he was everywhere. He was ubiquitous. And he had you know, a, a lot of big money behind him. Uh, in doing this. He had a, a hell of a PR machine behind him. 
that was largely coming out of uh, some right-wing billionaires, mostly out of Texas. And, and also the, uh, the, the uh, real estate industry, which had, had hired him before, before this to, to uh, shill for them, basically. And so Friedman came along and he said, hey, the solution to inflation is neoliberalism. You just need to adopt our, our, our way. And, uh, you know, um, we still weren't buying it. Uh, Nixon left office in disgrace. Jerry Ford came in. He started this whip inflation now program. That didn't work. Uh, Jerry Ford lost the next election. Jimmy Carter came in during the Carter presidency. Iran had a revolution and suddenly their oil was off the market. So just as inflation was getting better in 78, 79 and 79, the Shah of Iran falls and boom, the price of oil explodes again. And uh, so when Reagan came into office and, and, and that year, 79, uh, Margaret Thatcher, um, you know, fully came to power in the United Kingdom and she embraced neoliberalism. And the first thing she did was or one of the first things she did was break the largest and most powerful union in the country, the coal miners union. And then, you know, started privatizing British air, privatizing the railroads and all this kind of stuff. And Jimmy Carter thought, well, maybe there's something to this. And so he deregulated the, uh, the rail industry in the United States and the travel industry in the United States, and the airlines. Um, then Reagan came in and said, we're going to do the whole thing. We're going to do this whole hog in his um, uh, first inaugural address on January 20th, 1981, when he was right after he was sworn into office, minutes after he was sworn into office. He said, government is not the solution to our problems. Government, in fact, is the problem. And that became the mantra, the neoliberal mantra that has carried for the last 40 years. Um, so, you know, we got neoliberalism in the United States in 1981. There had been a previous experiment with neoliberalism, but it hadn't gone really well. And that was down in Chile in 1973. Um, uh, Chile had the, the nation's largest natural resource was copper. They were the world's supplier of copper. There were three major copper mines down there that were all owned by American companies. And those American companies were extracting copper and giving Chile uh, you know, royalties that were pennies on the dollar. So when Salvador Allende was uh, reelected um, in, in 73, he, he said, or maybe it was late 72, he came right out and said, uh, we're going to take back these, these copper mines. And he appointed a commission to decide to determine how what the value of them was, so that we could act, so that Chile could actually pay those American companies, um, you know, for their loss, which he did, by the way, and and they came up with numbers and they paid these three companies, and also uh, IT and T, International Telephone and Telegraph, owned about half of the phone systems of Chile, and he said we're going to take those and we're going to make them a government government operation also because it's a natural monopoly, and so IT and T and these copper barons went to Nixon and started complaining. IT&T had uh, a deal already with the CIA because the CIA uh, was working with IT&T all over the world, wherever they got a, uh, you know, wherever they could install phone systems, the CIA would tap those phone systems and know everything that was going on in the country. So the CIA and Henry, Henry Kissinger got together and plotted the overthrow of Allende. And that was, you know, with General Augusto Pinochet. And, uh, you know, he came into power and Friedman went down there and advised him on how to do shock therapy, neoliberal shock therapy. And, you know, by 1980, Americans weren't talking about this very much anymore, because by that time, um, uh, Chile had seen the, the largest and most rapid collapse of its GDP of any developed nation in the history of the world. Inflation was running at around 30 percent. Unemployment was running in the high 20s uh, percent. Uh, it was it was a complete basket case, and and people were revolting. And Pinochet's response was to uh, to, to torture and murder people in the national stadium, and uh, and to take people out on in helicopters and drop them in the ocean uh, as a way of killing them very publicly. Um, and in fact, he publicized this to to terrify people. I was uh, at a protest here in Portland a couple of years ago. And the, the Proud Boys were walking around with T-shirts that said free helicopter rides for liberals. That, that's what they were referring to as Pinochet. So that was, there have been four major experiments with neoliberalism in, in the history of the world, as it were. Um, you know, the, well, five, if you include the UK, but the UK never, I mean, they never got to the point of like doing away with their national health care system or doing away with free college education. Um, so basically Chile, the United States, uh, we imposed neoliberalism on Iraq. Um, and this was L. Paul Bremer and Paul and Wolfowitz and and 
uh, the uh, our Secretary of Defense uh, drawn a blank on it. Oh, Rump, Don Rumsfeld and uh, and Dick Cheney's idea. And they fired, they shut down all the government industries. The government owned about half of all the industry in Iraq. They shut them all down. They laid off the entire army. They destroyed all the labor unions. They dropped all the tariffs. And they said to every multinational company in the world, come to Iraq and loot the country, essentially, which happened. Um, and now Iraq, you know, what the, the, the predictable outcome of neoliberalism is oligarchy. Um, the rule by the rich, because it produces this massive inequality of wealth, and that wealth then reaches out for political power. And so, you know, Iraq went into its oligarchic phase, um, which it had already been with, with Saddam Hussein, largely. And then now it's basically a fascist country. Nouri al-Maliki is, is uh, you know, he pretends he's a Democrat, but he's a, a fascist. And, uh, and then Russia, in 1991, uh, Gorbachev, when he was unwinding the Soviet Union, he very publicly made it very clear that the role model for Russia that he had in mind was uh, Sweden. He wanted to turn Russia into a Scandinavian style democratic socialist country. He thought that would be an appropriate transition from a communist government where every need was taken care of to a democratic socialist government where just some needs were taken care of. You know, you wouldn't get free housing from the government anymore, but you would get free health care and free education, for example. And so, uh, you know, when, when they started making this transition, they needed a pile of money to do it. And Gorbachev and Yeltsin went to the International Monetary Fund and said, we need, uh, you know, a, a couple hundred billion dollars for this transition. And uh, this trans this happened over the, uh, the transition period from the George Herbert Walker Bush administration and the Bill Clinton administration and both Bush and Clinton were totally embracing neoliberalism at the time. And they, they had a big say at the IMF. And so the IMF basically said to Russia, we will only loan you this money if you embrace neoliberalism. And so Russia did. And the, the, the product within four or five years was oligarchy. And uh, the head oligarch was Vladimir Putin. And uh, you, you can see where that has gone. And so, you know, the, every time neoliberalism has been tried, it has been a terrible disaster for the people, for the country, uh, for basically everybody. Um, and yet you will still find it's being, you know, waved around as the solution to everything. In fact, if you, if you Google Chile and, and their economy, you'll find that for every website telling the true story of what happened in Chile, there's, there's eight or nine websites produced by right-wing think tanks and, and uh, right-wing publications talking about the Chilean miracle and isn't it wonderful, wasn't it wonderful what Pinochet did? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. But, um, you know, basically for 40 years here in the United States, we have been living in this neoliberal experiment that Reagan started, um, Bush continued, although Bush thought it was nuts. You'll recall in the 1980 election, if you're old enough to remember, um, during the primary, Bush uh, said that neoliberalism was voodoo economics, that Reagan's ideas were, were crazy. Uh, once he became vice president, he started singing a different tune. But he did try to raise taxes on the rich when he became president, and it backfired. And that's arguably one of the reasons he was only a one-term president. Um, and then Bill Clinton came along, and, and he thought neoliberalism was just fine. I mean, we hadn't, we'd seen the horrors of what happened in Chile, but we hadn't seen what happened in Russia yet. And, and Iraq, you know, was still, you know, 20 years in the future, a decade and a half in the future anyway. And so Bill Clinton bought into it completely and uh, ended welfare as we know it, time limited it to five years, which we now know five years out produced an explosion in childhood poverty in the United States. And, uh, you know, signed NAFTA and, and uh, continued Reagan's work with the, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade to, for the World Trade Organization. And then George W. Bush came along and doubled down on that in 2001, giving China most favored nation status. And, uh, you know, with this whole free trade idea so that American companies could move to China. And, uh, uh, you know, the result of this has been basically the destruction of the American middle class. When Reagan came into office, we had 30% of roughly a third of Americans had a union job. Uh, which meant that two thirds of Americans had the equivalent of a union job in terms of pay and benefits um, because the unions set the local wage floors. Um, today it's 6% in the private economy have a union job. And um, instead of 65% of Americans being in the middle class, we're down to 45% of Americans in the middle class. And even at that, 
you can no longer stay in the middle class with a single paycheck like you could in 1980. Um, and many of the people who are living a middle class lifestyle are only doing so with massive amounts of debt, um, student debt, credit card debt, mortgage debt, just you know, a massive overhang of, of uh, debt. We now have uh, two or three men, depending on whose numbers you're using, who, who own more wealth than the bottom 50% of Americans. Um, we have social and political unrest. Um, we have uh, basically uh, entered a period of oligarchy, uh, in particular over the last 15 years or so. The Supreme Court helped facilitate this by ruling in, in a series of decisions that culminated with Citizens United in 2010 that political bribery is not a thing anymore that when billionaires or corporations give money to uh, politicians to do what they want, that's not bribery, that's not corruption, that is uh, free speech. That's First Amendment protected, constitutionally protected free speech. And uh, you know, corporations are persons too, they're entitled to First Amendment rights, Bill of Rights uh, privileges, or rights rather, under the constitution. The problem with oligarchy, and that's why in the last 20 years, you haven't seen any consequential legislation pass that benefits the average person more than it benefits giant corporations. Even Obamacare handed far more money to the health insurance companies and far more profits, massive profits to them, um, far more of an advantage to them than it was to the American people. It was another neoliberal policy. Um, and, and Congress is paralyzed because the entire Republican Party is still has still bought into neoliberalism. And about a third of the Democratic Party is still there, although the Democratic Party is changing very rapidly. And thank God we've got finally, uh, after both uh, uh, Clinton and Obama uh, continuing neoliberal policies, we've got a president in President Biden who is fighting that, who's speaking back against it, who is uh, you know, aggressively trying to uh, reverse or undo neoliberalism in the United States. The problem, of course, is Congress. I mean, for example, the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, one of the great neoliberal ideas was public-private partnerships. In other words, anytime government spends money, all of that money should go through the hands of some private corporation so that some, somebody who can become a political donor can make a buck. And uh, Joe Manchin wrote, uh, demanded and wrote into both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act public-private partnership requirements. So every penny that gets spent from either of those programs has to go through a for-profit corporation before it does anything. In, in, in the economy. So the problem with oligarchy is that, and, and uh, those of you who attended my talk on the hidden history of American oligarchy will remember this, is that oligarchy is a transitional economic and political system. It rarely survives more than one or two generations. Oligarchy, typically one of two things happens. Either it collapses into democracy as a result of a democracy movement rising up from the grassroots and saying, no, we don't want this anymore, which may be what we're seeing happen in Russia right now. There's you know, a fascinating time there. And certainly, I believe, is what we're seeing happen in the United States. Or on the other hand, it flips into full-blown fascism, where you get a strongman leader and you know, rule by the iron fist, and you know, which is also what's happening here. You've got the Republican Party trying to turn us into a fascist, or uh, to, to quote the President of the United States, a semi-fascist country, and you've got the Democratic Party trying to make us, you know, a democracy once again. So we'll have to see how this shakes out. But neoliberalism set the stage for all this by creating this American oligarchy that we have been living in, in particular, in the last you know 15 years, uh, 20 years, uh, or thereabouts. Um, this then raises the question, what do we do about this? Oligarchy, excuse me, neoliberalism is a, uh, you know, a political and economic system, but it's one made up of a whole bunch of policy decisions. So it, the way that we can break oligarchy or reverse oligarchy or do away with oligarchy is pretty straightforward. Um, we just need to systematically, step by step, reverse the policies that were imposed on us by neoliberals, uh, in the White House and in Congress over the last 40 years and take America back to um, you know, a, a regulated capitalism or forward to regulated capitalism. Uh, by the way, this, this uh, battle is not uniquely being fought in the United States. Neoliberals have gained a significant beachhead in France. Uh, Macron is a neoliberal and proud of it. Um, of course, they still have uh, uh, basically control the Tories in the United Kingdom. 
Um, there's a, a huge neoliberal movement in Sweden right now. Um, there's a smaller neoliberal movement in Italy. Um, there was one in Greece uh, that got pretty badly discredited after, after the failures uh, of that. So, so anyhow, what are the policies that we should do if we wanna end neoliberalism in the United States? Number one, we need to go back to rational taxes. Um, Franklin Roosevelt raised the top tax rate on the morbidly rich to 91%. Now, it wasn't 91% for the average worker. Um, you had to earn more than about $3 million in today's dollars, or actually about $3 million in $2,000, probably around five or $6 million in today's dollars before you started paying that 91% top tax rate. But that was, you know, that stood through the, through the Roosevelt administration, the Truman administration, the Eisenhower administration, the Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration. Um, and then Lyndon Johnson dropped that down to, down to 74%. And that stood through the Nixon administration, the Ford administration, and the Carter administration. And what it did, what that top tax rate did on, on the morbidly rich was it prevented this massive explosion of inequality. Um, you know, you go back and look at the old, uh, you know, TV shows from, you know, back in the day, I, you know, I, Louise and I were watching Bewitched <laughs> Sunday morning, just looking for something dumb to watch on TV. And, you know, uh, here's the, the Larry, Larry Tate, the, the owner of a Madison Avenue ad agency. I mean, that, that's a bad, if you own a Madison Avenue ad agency now, you've got, you know, a mansion in the Hamptons and he had this house, middle class house in the suburbs. Um, it's, you know, CEOs lived in the communities where their employees live very often. They might've had a much fancier house, but they lived in, the, you know, the average CEO only made 30 times what the average worker made. Now you've got the average CEO making 400, 500 in some industries in finance, for example, it can be 10,000 times what the average worker makes in, in banking and finance. So that top tax rate acted as a regulator for that. It prevented that you know, explosion of wealth and uh, what goes along with that explosion of wealth is the loss of wealth at the bottom half. There has been, since Reagan introduced neoliberalism in 1981, there has been a $50 trillion transfer of wealth in the United States from the working class, from the bottom 95% to the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans, $50 trillion. And the principal thing that prevented that from happening prior to 1981 was that top tax rate. There was also a top, and, and you know, doing away with it is what facilitated it. Uh, there was also a top 50, 52, 53% corporate income tax rate. The same deal. Corporations were then incentivized to, you know, if you had money, you would, you know, if you showed a profit, you had a choice. You could either pay a 50% tax on that profit, or you could invest in new products. You could advertise, you know, and expand your company. You could open new stores. You could grow your company because all those are tax deductible. They all reduce your taxes. So there was a strong incentive with a high tax rate on corporations for corporations to do things that were actually good for corporations. Now that, you know, more than half of major American corporations pay nothing in income taxes um, and, and billionaires are paying an average 3%. Now we've got, you know, the, the morbidly rich on the personal level and on the corporate level, you've got corporations who don't, you know, expand, they don't innovate, they don't pay their workers well, uh, they don't use that extra money to do any of those things. Instead, they just pass it out as dividends to their shareholders and as huge obscene bonuses to their CEOs and their senior executives. So number one, we need to go back to an over 50% top tax rate for the morbidly rich and at least an over 35% tax rate for corporations to, to incentivize good behavior, basically. Uh, number two, we need to return labor unions. Um, uh, Elizabeth Warren has legislation right now, she's proposed the, the National uh, Right to Unionize Act that would uh, uh, negate parts of Taft-Hartley, the so-called work for right to work for less uh, law, and um, that, that would give Give people the ability to, to join a, a labor union and participate, you know, in 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 uh, the management of the company essentially through through collective bargaining. We need to bring back labor. Number three, we need to start breaking up these monopolies that have formed. Um, you know, as I laid out when I was here talking about my book, The Hidden History of Monopolies, um, there is no longer a single industry in the United States of any consequence that is not now dominated by fewer than five companies. Um, whether it's airlines or hotels or internet access or cell phones or clothing or retail or whatever it may be, 
uh, you know, typically a maximum of five companies act as cartels or oligarchies. This is wildly against the law. I mean, and those laws are still on the books. The Sherman Antitrust Act of, of 1881, I think it was, it was 1891. Um, the uh, Clayton Antitrust Act of 1927, the, uh, the Antitrust Act of 1957, it was just called that. Uh, they're all still on the books. But in 1983, Ronald Reagan instructed the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Securities and Exchange Commission to stop enforcing the antitrust laws. And that led to this explosion of mergers and acquisition activity. We had the, the M&A mania, you know, Michael Milken and all this stuff. And they made movies about it, you know, in Wall Street in 1987, starring Michael Douglas. They were the heroes, the masters of the universe. Well, we need to reverse that. We need to break up these giant companies, particularly in the media, in my industry. Um, but uh, right across the board. Next, uh, education. Uh, Ronald Reagan, when he came into office, you could go to college. You know, if you were uh, capable of getting into a college, uh, you could go to college pretty much anywhere in the country and pay for it with a part-time job. I, I paid for my tuition back in 1968, uh, the short time that I went to college, uh, washing dishes at Bob's Big Boy and pumping gas at the Esso station on Trowbridge Road in East Lansing, Michigan. Um, you know, you could do that. Uh, land grant colleges were were the gift of Abraham Lincoln, and they were designed to be free colleges all across the United States, and they were so cheap that they were functionally that. Um, Reagan reversed that. 80% of, of the cost of college was paid for by state and federal government when Reagan came into office in 1980. Now, 80% of the cost of college is paid for with tuition, and only 20% is covered by state and federal. We need to go back to that 80-20 that we had before and do away with student debt and let people go to college again in the United States and trade school as well. Um, we need to give Americans access to health care. This year, we are slipping down to number 50 in the world in terms of life expectancy. And every single country that has a better life expectancy than us has a national health care system, every single one of them, all the way down to countries like Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, they have a national health care system that's essentially free, and you can go to college for free in Costa Rica. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like, and we can't, right? We're the richest country in the world, and we can't do this because we got to send tax cuts to the, to the billionaires. Um, and finally, we need to increase the minimum wage, um, you know, to something reasonable, at least $15 an hour, um, uh, so that we no longer have people living in poverty. And we need to strengthen the social safety net. Um, you know, with uh, programs that support food and housing and things like that. So those are the solutions. And, and that's essentially the whole book. <laughs> I hope you'll still buy it. But, but uh, I, I've, I've kind of given you a 45 minute uh, summary of what's in the book. Of course, in the book, you'll find all the references and footnotes and links and things for any any of the statements that I've made. If you want to back them up, if you want to, you know, uh, uh, you know, win the water cooler wars. Uh, here's how to do it. So this is what we need to break uh, neoliberalism. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Nick and, and uh, he can moderate our Q&A for the last 15 minutes here. Excellent. All right, great. Thanks, Tom. All right, let's get into it. Um, let's see, we're going to start here. Let's see. Let's go with this one. So um, Kurt Herner asks, would you say that, that non-compete clauses in the workplace are a result of neoliberalism? And do you think that President Biden's executive order outlawing them in July 2021 is a nail in neoliberalism's coffin? What I would say to? that um, they are the product of neoliberalism to the extent that they reflect the massive imbalance of power between corporations, between employers and employees, which came about as a result of neoliberalism and the destruction of labor unions by neoliberalism. Um, but on their face, they would defy neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, um, well, actually, arguably, they wouldn't because these are agreements between employers and employees. They're not, you know, government's not involved in these. So, yeah, this would be completely consistent with neoliberal philosophy. Um, this is why neoliberals say there should be no minimum wage. Um, in fact, Rand Paul, who's, you know, the, the kind of, you know, number one neoliberal in Congress, has come out and said we should do away with child labor laws. So, yeah, it's absolutely neoliberalism. And like I said, Joe Biden is the first president in 40 years now to take on neoliberalism head on. And God bless him for it. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see. 
So Marsha Bookstein um, asks, would you like to comment on the GATS Treaty, General Agreement on Trade and Services, Bill Clinton, and the ratchet clause that will only allow more privatization? I'm, I'm not um, a scholar of, of GATT, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really, I can't give you a, I'm, I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with those things, but I'm worried that I might be offering speculation as if it was fact. So I'll pass on that question. I'm okay, sorry. sounds good. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, let's see. I have a question here that's about, so um, Kurt, Kurt Herner again asks, he says, I know you, that your next book will be The Hidden History of American Democracy. Do you have any idea of your, I guess, 10th book or uh, books after it? He said, it's maybe public education, maybe the environment. Just more questions about your future books. Sure, sure. Well, you know, when we started this this uh, book series back, uh, we're doing two a year, and this is the eighth book, so I guess it was four years ago. Um, the idea was that we were going to do four books. And then the fourth book did really well, and the publisher said, hey, you want to do a fifth? And then that did well, and they said, you want to do a sixth? And it's literally been that. You know, every time I turn in a book, it's like, okay, this is the last book. And then you know, a month or so later, I get a call from from Neil, my editor, going, "Hey, you got another book in you? you know, this is we could we could do something with this." Um, but as far as I know, right now, our plans are that, uh, in fact, this was supposed to be the last book, the eighth book, and then they were going to do a box set. Um, but but then I I really wanted to write a book about the history of American democracy, and I've talked about this on the radio, which you know he must be listening to the, to my show. And uh, so I've been spending the last few months living in, in uh, Ben Franklin's head mostly, and uh, the Wendats and the Iroquois and uh, the, the French and, and, uh, and British philosophers of the Enlightenment. And I'm really excited about that book and it's gonna be a lot of fun. But as far as I know, that's gonna be the last book. Uh, but you never know, <laughs> you never know. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, Susan Hoffman asks, she says first, um, it, well, we don't worry about it. She says, she says, sorry if this is a stupid question, but it's not a stupid question. But so there's no stupid how, question. There's no stupid question. So how does neoliberalism work with the internet, email, and social media? Do these things enable neoliberalism? She says, uh, let's see, very confusing with neo neoliberalism coming in uh, in history pre-internet. And then yeah. Says, yeah. No, neoliberalism is ruling the roost with regard to the internet. Um, uh, Donald Trump and Ajit Pai uh, did away with uh, a regulation. This was neoliberal policy. They did away with uh, what was called net neutrality. So now your internet service provider, the company that brings internet into your home, uh, has the legal ability, and most of them do, to literally uh, keep track of every single website you visit, how much time you spend on that website, uh, read every one of your emails, um, look over your shoulder when you check your bank statements. I mean, all this stuff, all of this is, is now public information and it's for sale by uh, this massive industry, this massive data industry. This was my last book that we talked about six months ago, The Hidden History of Big Brother. So uh, there's that. And then on top of that, uh, you know, back, I used to run forums back in the 80s for CompuServe, and we had a policy of not allowing anonymity. Um, which actually produced really good behavior on people's parts. You know, if you weren't anonymous, um, uh, but uh, there are functionally no regulations for uh, Facebook, Twitter, you know, the social media, as it were, and therefore you've got Russian trolls, and you've got you know uh, stalkers, and you've got all kinds of just bat guano crazy stuff going on that uh, frankly, in my opinion, could be fixed with some regulation. And I talked about that in the book, The Hidden History of Big Brother. Um, but neoliberalism still reigns, uh, sadly, and uh, every effort to regulate these companies, I mean, right now, there's just an effort to, to maybe, you know, break them up or stop them from getting bigger and bigger. And they're already running ads, you know, saying, uh, it's, you know, keep your hands off big tech, you know, you're going to destroy jobs and quack, quack, quack. And of course, these are, this is a trillion dollar industry now. So, you know, as long as the Supreme Court holds this position that bribing politicians is, is just free speech, it's going to be a hell of a lift to lift social media out of this uh, uh, neoliberal embrace. Yeah. Um, so, um, let's see, an anonymous attendee asks, um, please explain better how Biden and his administrations push back against neoliberalism, or how he's pushing back against neoliberalism. Is, 
is this consistent with backing and pushing continuing war in Ukraine? I think they're completely separate issues. Uh, war, in, war in Ukraine is, uh, you know, international geopolitics, and it has to do with, you know, uh, international alliances, whose side we're on, what we stand for in the world, those kinds of things. You know, I get it that there are people like Rand Paul, who who is very much on the side of Russia in this conflict, who try to say, oh, yeah, this is just the military industrial complex trying to make money. Uh, you know, we can debate that, but this has nothing to do with neoliberalism. Um, what was the first part of the question? I'm sorry. Was, uh, yeah, he's just. Um, oh, what's Biden more, doing yeah, to push back? Push back uh, yeah, Biden's yeah. doing a lot to push back on neoliberalism. He's 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 uh, he's trying to get rights for labor back. He's trying to reduce the cost of education. He's trying to expand health care, access to health care. Um, uh, he's he's. He's, he's trying to get uh, to encourage communities to develop broadband systems. He's, he's uh, trying to uh, stimulate new economies. I didn't even get into Alexander Hamilton's American plan, by the way, which is the last two chapters of the book, um, which is what built American industry, which was abandoned in 1981 by Reagan. Um, but uh, and it's what it was adopted by China, oddly enough, in 1993. And that's how China got as rich as they are by doing what we did before Reagan. China, there was this huge battle in China. I was living in China in November of 1988 and, uh, or 80, 80, yeah, 87. And there was this huge debate inside China about should, you know, because Mao was dead and the Cultural Revolution was a failure. Should we become neoliberal like America has, or should we go uh, and, and, and do what America did before neoliberalism? which was Alexander Hamilton's American plan, which is protect domestic industries with tariffs, encourage export of finished goods, encourage import of raw materials, um, but don't export raw materials and you know, quack, quack, quack. And, and uh, China adopted Alexander Hamilton's American plan. Russia adopted Milton Friedman's neoliberalism. And you can see the difference between the two. Next year, China will be the largest economy in the world. And right now their middle class is larger than the entire United States. So there you go. Yeah, that's good. Um, let's see, let's do this one. So Kim Berlin Ward asks, what economic and or political conditions caused people to vote for Reagan and accept neoliberalism? I guess you talked a little bit about this, but- I think it was mostly was inflation, yeah. you know, and, 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 and what was called stagflation. I mean, not only did we have inflation in the late 70s uh, and, and the first year or two of the 80s, um, but the, the economy stopped growing during that period of time because people just didn't have money to buy things because inflation was cutting into their buying power. And uh, so the economy became stagnant. There was high unemployment. There was high inflation. Um, you know, everybody agreed these were terrible things. Nobody knew exactly what to do about it. The Fed was doing the best they could. Um, you know, it was mostly supply shock. It mostly had to do with the price of oil. Um, but, you know, that doesn't you can tell people that all day long, but you know, it's not going to stop them from voting for the other guy. So uh, when Milton Friedman, you know, uh, along with Reagan, went on a uh, literally a, a nationwide sales pitch tour throughout 79, 80 and 81 for neoliberalism, you know, Americans thought, what the hell, let's try it. Yeah. Um, in, yeah, the, I was going to say this. The second part of Kim's question also, she says, I guess it's kind of wanting to know, it looks like she's, she says, there, I know there's a lot of talk about unionized workers being lazy and the mythical welfare mother. And it says, it seems like people don't, still don't regret Reagan or maybe don't know what was, what really happened, but yeah. Um, there was this thing called the Reagan Legacy Project that a bunch of billionaires put together after Reagan died. And they have built a statue to Ronald Reagan or named a building after Reagan in every single county in America and every democratic country in the world. And they have uh, spent probably tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars reinventing Ronald Reagan's image and reinventing the history of Reagan and his presidency. I mean, he was one of the most corrupt presidents we had. You know, Iran-Contra was, was a horror show. The deal he cut with uh, with the Ayatollahs to hold the hostages so he could defeat Jimmy Carter was treason. And the president of Iran came out and, and told us that, you know, Bonnie Sauter, he moved to the United States and he said, yeah, we cut this deal with Reagan in 1980 during the election to hold the hostages to screw Jimmy Carter. And in exchange for that, Reagan shipped us a whole bunch of weapons because we had all these American weapon systems, these F-15s and things, and we needed spare parts and we needed missiles. And Reagan was shipping those missiles. I mean, even before the election, 
happened. The, we were shipping tires uh, for F-15s via, you know, transshipping them via Israel to Iran. So, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> the Reagan legacy is really grim, but you wouldn't know it from looking at the internet or asking the average American. Yeah. Um, this is uh, kind of an interesting question here from Wendy uh, Fernside. She asks, is there a more intuitive name than neoliberalism that would make it easier for people to understand? Yeah, I call it Reaganism or, right. or the Reagan revolution or trickle-down economics or supply-side economics. They're all, they're all essentially describing the same thing. I mean, neoliberalism is a, a much larger, more coherent philosophy with you know, all these little pieces sliced and diced into it as I lay out in the book. But you know, for shorthand, when you're just trying to inform people about it, probably the easiest way to do it is to say, you know, we've been for 40 years, we've been living in this Reagan revolution experiment, this Reaganism experiment, and it's not working. We need to raise the taxes back to where they were. We need to bring back the labor unions. We need to bring our damn jobs home. And, and we need to, you know, clean up the environment, reimpose regulation on, on, on uh, big companies. And at that point, typically for people, the light goes off and they go, yeah, okay, you know, maybe Ross Perot was right. <laughs> that was the big battle over neoliberalism, by the way, it was the 1992 election. Ross Perot carried 20% of the vote. You know, just just saying, hey, if you guys keep going down this neoliberal road, like both Bill Clinton and George Herbert Walker Bush are talking about, you're going to see this giant sucking sound from the South. Sure enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we get maybe just time for maybe one or two more questions here. Um, I'm a, so Teresa Wilson asks uh, or says, I believe the road to raising taxes on corporations and the wealthy is to have the government finance elections and then candidates would not be beholden to these wealthy donors. But how would you accomplish that? Well, I don't. I don't disagree. Um, you know, with with her uh, analysis, I'm, I'm I'm not sure it's quite that simple. But uh, that that would be a great way to do it. Um, you know, it's a, the the answer is politics. You know, it it just it, it's uh, we have to elect enough people who don't believe in neoliberalism. And there's a lot of great candidates out there who don't, you know, the, I remember back, uh, geez, 10, 15 years ago, I did a fundraiser for the Congressional Progressive Caucus back when Raul Grijalva was running it. It had been started by Bernie Sanders, of, you know, maybe 20, 25 years ago, 20 some odd years ago. And at that time, it only had about 18 members. I mean, you know, we maybe 100 people showed up. It was in New Mexico and, and we had and we raised like $2,000. Um, now it's the second largest caucus in Washington, D.C. It's a big deal. They got a lot of power. And so, you know, vote for progressives and, you know, let them carry the ball. So I have actually had a couple of questions here about kind of the younger generation, um, sort of like the. And so I'm going to ask this anonymous attendee says, I'm a parent of a teen and a 20 something. And she said, she, um, uh, this person asks, um, are you aware of anyone who is already writing your caliber of information but catered to younger folks? And also, second question is, would you ever consider creating editions of your books that are more accessible to younger, younger uh, readers? It's actually pretty accessible, but yeah, I think it's pretty accessible. But. Yeah, well, you've, you've read it, eh, yeah. Nick. So. I think it's pretty accessible. Yeah. But, but yeah. yeah, so. so I mean, that's my that's been my goal in this entire series is to write books that are that are fewer than 150 pages. This book is only 150 pages, um, you know, plus footnotes um, and that are written in plain English. Uh, there's no jargon in this book. It's plain English. And uh, so I, I would uh, encourage you to check it out and even pass my book along to your kids. Um, Naomi Klein wrote a book called Shock Doctrine. Now, this was a decade ago. But uh, it was a book about neoliberalism, essentially. Um, Milton Friedman was the guy who invented the phrase. Um, I don't know of any other authors that are specifically writing for a younger market. Um, I'm an old fart myself, so I don't pay that much attention to that, you know, to the, to the marketplace of books and those, you know, by segregating them out that way. But uh, Naomi Klein's writings, uh, her newest book, This Changes Everything. She came to Portland. I, I, she and I did a, a presentation together. She's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. And uh, so I encourage, encourage you to read her book. She certainly knows what she's talking about. And she's pretty wired in with younger generation folks, being younger herself than I am, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember at her events, we had a lot of younger people came to her events, a lot of even high school. And so, yeah, definitely yeah. she seems good. Um, 
Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tom, for being with us today. And thank you, for everyone, for all those questions. I'm sorry we didn't, we, they kept coming in and we weren't able to kind of get to everyone's questions, but we vastly appreciate you know, all the interest and just for everyone tuning in today. Um, so now go to the link and purchase a book, you know, The Hidden History of Neoliberalism, this book. Um, also check out Tom's other books, all the others in the series, this uh, same design and everything else. And uh, while you're there on pals.com, check out our upcoming events. We've got lots of awesome stuff ahead in the next coming, upcoming months. So check out that too. And I uh, hope we see you all at another event. Um, but Thank you. Thank you again so much, Tom, for joining us. And, and thank you, Nick, for moderating this and Adam for doing the technical stuff. And, and thank you for showing up for all the people who showed up. But uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's it's uh, great fun doing this. And it's uh, even even better knowing that people are taking it to heart and carrying on the message. So now tag your it, you know, share this message with somebody else. Excellent. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. And yep. uh, have everyone have a good evening out there. And uh, thanks for joining us. So, bye.